job of differentiating nociception from pain. You know, nociception is the uh, process by which there's noxious stimuli transmitted through the central and peripheral nervous systems. And so essentially it's the input of the system, the physiologic input of the system. There are nociceptors in skin, muscle, bone. They detect mechanical, chemical, and thermal stimuli. And it's really the body's protective mechanism. But pain itself is, is entirely different. Pain is a higher cortical uh, function. It's, it's, it's a complex constellation of in, unpleasant sensory, emotional, cognitive experience that's provoked by real or perceived tissue damage manifested by autonomic, psychological, and behavioral reactions. So the important thing is that pain is subjective. Uh, it's a psychosocial, emotional, and experiential process. So people take their past experiences and project that onto their current pain. Uh, and so essentially the pain is the output. The nociceptive is the input, pain is the output. So it's subjective. So it's very hard to quantify a subjective problem. And if you never read this, this is kind of an interesting book. Uh, sorry, it's not, it doesn't project well, but this is called The Gift of Pain. Uh, Dr. Paul Brand was a, uh, one of the founding fathers of hand surgery, and he happened to also be a missionary. Uh, so there is a little bit of religious bend to the book, but the point is that he, was, uh, he did a lot of work with, uh, with leprosy and treating people uh, infected with leprosy. And the biggest problem with a lot of the disability and deformities from leprosy had to do with the, lo the loss of pain sensation. So the whole point of the book is that, that pain is a gift and that we should understand it and, and take it, use it to our advantage. And that, and that the idea that you shouldn't have any pain at all is, is, is a complete fallacy. So, but it's, it's worth reading, especially if you're treating patients in this, uh, in this, in this vein. Um, so, and this is an interesting study that came out which is also uh, just worth mentioning briefly, they looked, uh, they looked at patients in an emergency room with, specifically coming in with uh, moderate, severe, acute upper extremity pain. They looked at you know, more, than 14, more, more than 400 patients, and they ran, randomized them to, see, to receive either ibuprofen and acetaminophen, uh, Percocet, Vicodin, or, or Tylenol-3. They gave them a single dose, and they looked at their pain reduction in two hours, and there was no statistically significant difference between the pain relief from both. So bottom line with that, the takeaway message is that ibuprofen and Tylenol do, do just as well as, as opioids for most acute pain scenarios. And I can tell you my son just had his tonsils out yesterday and the doctor gave him only Tylenol and ibuprofen and so far he's doing great. So, so I, mean, I think that there's a lot of truth to, to that statement uh, for sure. And then the other thing we have to understand is pain and disability. Um, that the disability associated with pain has a lot to do with the patient's underlying uh, mood and coping strategies. So that it's really a high, like again, it's a higher level, psych it has a lot to do with their, their sort of psychological well-being as, as much as it has to do with their physiologic distress. Um, negative predictors of disability, these include depression, pain anxiety, catastrophic thinking, which is a big one, and kinesiophobia or fear of movement. And I think the, the therapists here probably really understand this part very well. Because uh, we are, we're, even though we kind of, as surgeons, we see, see them, we treat them, and then we sort of hand them off. And, and the therapists, the ones that they have a lot of the day-to-day -day interactions with them during the recovery process, and probably understand this you know, more than we do. And, and it's important to look out for the language that the patients come in with. They're, they use a lot of absolute statements like they're excruciating, it's unbearable. And you can spot these guys a mile away. You see them when they're coming in, you see them with their body language, the way their posture is, their look on their face. And maybe you don't quantify it, but you get this gestalt feeling, and I get it all the time. You just walk in and say, you, "This guy is not going to do well," and you know it. You know, and, and and maybe, and this is just a way of quantifying sort of that I think gut reaction we get from a lot of people. So someone came up with this pain catastrophizing scale. Uh, just basically, it's a way of quantifying how somebody experiences their pain. Uh, and these people that are that have this catastrophic thinking, they tend to ruminate about pain. They magnify the importance of their pain. They feel helpless. So it's just a, a sort of helplessness feeling, and it which prevents people from being active participants in their recovery. And it's, it's a scale you can't see it very well here, unfortunately, but it's it's readily available. It just quickly it says, you know, I, I you, know, you grade it from, you know, I worry about all the, that the pain will never end. I feel I can't go on. It's terrible. It's never going to end. All these kind of feelings, and you. you adds up to a score, and essentially you get the higher scores the patients do worse. But you know, again, we all know this. And I think what's important now that's coming out as people really are concentrating on, the evidence does support this, is multimodal pain management. So this is using a variety of analgesic medications and techniques to target different mechanisms of action. Uh, and, there, and these also have been shown to be effective in decreasing opioid use. 
Uh, and the risk factors for prolonged opioid use or misuse are younger patients, history of substance abuse, any psychiatric diagnosis, and any patient persons with chronic pain. Um, another very interesting study worth mentioning, uh, they looked at the effectiveness of this multimodal opioid reduction program specifically for hand surgery patients. They did about 145 patients. They, they looked at disarrays, fractures of carpal tunnel, so a soft tissue procedure and a bony procedure. And they gave prescriptions, they had a guideline, but they let, really left it in the end up to the surgeon's discretion as to how many were prescribed. But in addition to the pain medication, they got handouts, they, got, they were encouraged verbally and written down to take over-the-counter medications. They were instructed to keep a daily pain diary, and each patient took one of these pain catastrophizing scales. And what they found was that for carpal tunnel patients, you know, after the protocol was introduced, they prescribed on average 10 pills per patient as opposed to 20, 22 pills, a reduction of more than 50% in a year. And the average consumption was three pills versus, with 11 over-the-counter pills for a carpal tunnel surgery. And for a distal radius fracture, which we all assume would be a fairly painful operation, they were, they were almost reduced in half from, from 40 pills to 25 pills, and the average use was 16 pills with 20 over-the-counter pills. They all patients had high satisfaction. There was, the other interesting point is only 10 of the 110 pay, pills that were left over were disposed of properly, which is another issue. Uh, but the patients that did not do well were the ones that had a higher pain catastrophizing scale and the ones that used more than two times the amount of the opioids. So I think that, that we can all put a better effort, and myself, I, I, mean, I think about this all the time, into reducing the amount of prescriptions we're giving and to helping our patients. So this is what I do, and what I've started doing, uh, is having a preoperative discussion. So, you know, making patients preoperatively understand that this will be a painful experience for them. You're not going to get out of this one pain-free. It just doesn't happen. That's not realistic. But the pain will be manageable, and it's okay to have it, and it's normal, and we expect it. Um, and the other thing is the intraoperative local anesthesia is also very important. Try to give it pre-incision. We give, we give you know, local anesthetic nerve blocks at the time of surgery so that at least in the first 24 hours that they're really having minimal discomfort, they're taking their pain medication at that time. So they're really staying ahead of the pain the whole time. We have uh, an acetaminophen uh, naproxen protocol that we use. So I recommend taking Tylenol arthritis and, and Aleve. You know, the evening of surgery and then every then twice a day together for at least the next four, you know, 40 to 72 hours with the opioids only on top for breakthrough pain uh, and, and give fairly limited opioid one-time prescriptions. And then also it's, you know, it's a constant reevaluation and you know, understanding that patients may need ancillary help, they may need the referral to therapy on an earlier basis, they may need pain management if their pain really can't be controlled or if they have, end up with other issues. Um, but I think this is something that we're you know, striving to be very thoughtful about, and hope that you guys will do the same. So I want to say thank you, and, uh, and you know, enjoy the program. Uh, does it, and shall I open up. Anyone have any questions about that or anything else before we uh, before we get rolling? Okay. So I don't know if I may be a little ahead of schedule here. I'm a little, we're a little ahead of schedule, but we can we can try start things along. So our, our, first, uh, our first speaker of the day will be Dr. Thomas Davenport. Uh, Dr. Davenport is going to give a talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, just a quick word about Dr. Davenport is that uh, he... <laughs> uh, Dr. Davenport went to, <laughs> got his uh, MD from Yale University, uh, completed general surgery.